Good morning, Bethel Sunridge. It is so great to have you with us wherever you're watching, whether you're in person or whether you're online or, you know, maybe you're going to be watching this a few days later. But we are so glad that you have joined with us and taken some time to just hang out with us. It is a rainy day here in sunny Sunridge, but it was a, it is already a good day. We had a great first service this morning, uh, pretty much to capacity. It was awesome. The presence of God was here. But today we are ready to celebrate the King. So before we get to a time of worship, why don't we just take a second and just welcome him here and to pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you that we get the opportunity to freely come and to worship you. Lord, this morning we lay down everything from our week behind and everything that we maybe are looking to the week ahead and we say, God, it's yours. Whatever is going on, we say, God, we're going to lay it down and for this time we're just going to focus it on you. God, provide us with joy, peace, and hope in this time that we do. So from the first note that is played or that is sung, let it just be a great sound to you. We give you our morning. We give you everything that we are. We ask these things in your holy name we pray. Amen. Let's worship together.
thank you so much for that truth. Lord, we thank you that those words, they're just so full of truth, that you are an awesome God, that you're generous, that you're holy, that you're there for us. Lord, we just pray that that truth would resonate into our hearts and into our minds, and it wouldn't stop at one end of that 18-inch journey. Lord, but instead we would recognize no matter what we're up against this week, no matter what is we're battling with even today, that we can lay that down at your feet because you are an awesome God. You are so holy. You're above all things, and all things come from you. Lord, we just want to live in that truth. We want to walk in that truth. So this morning, we just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would reveal that to us, that we would know the words that we said are true, and we would walk them forth. So Lord, we just, we give you the rest of our service. We say, have your way. Wherever we're watching from, have your way. We ask all these things. In your holy name we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you so much, team. It is so good to be, to be with everybody online. i got to get some props before I forget. But it is, hopefully you are having a good day wherever you are watching. And uh, it is great to have a few with us in-house today. It's a good problem. We have been overflowing our mornings, and we're starting to slowly trickle in uh, into our second one. And uh, God is so good, amen? You can, hit, you can hit like, and in person, it's good. You can actually say something back. It's so much nicer having somebody here. But last week, we were on a journey, and our journey was we had started a series called Masked. And if you weren't with us last week, I'll give you a little, a little tidbit to get us ready for it. Mast is all about what lies beneath. We're not getting into a debate one way or the other about these masks. It's just what we have right now. But we're actually talking about the masks that go on our heart. 
the masks that we put on our lives and put on our hearts to try to protect ourselves or to hide stuff. And so last week we talked about different kinds of masks that we all wear, and we all do. We all put them on. For many of us, it's actually our favorite part of our wardrobe. It's something we will not leave without. We would rather walk out with a dirty shirt and mums all around the world are grimacing about that. But we put on a mask because we want to make sure that we present ourselves as how we want to be seen. And we talked about Genesis and Adam and Eve. So if you want to hear that, you can find it on YouTube or on Facebook. This morning, though, we go to week two. And in week two, it is all about shaking it off. And I don't know about you, and I shared this morning a bit of an illustration have you ever bit into something, or maybe you had a meal, and something looked better than it really was? And I shared that there was a time when we lived in Windsor, we had some family friends, and they were amazing, they were, their names were the Elors, and man, could they ever cook. Uh, she was just an amazing cook, they had a beautiful home, and I remember going over to their house for supper one time, and it was this fancy big spread, and they were of a different nationality background than us, so I'd never seen some of this food, but it looked kind of like a chicken, or maybe it was quail, and it was cooked so amazing, and when you walked in, you just smelt it, and each one were on your plate, and it looked like you were at a restaurant, and then finally they said grace, and it was time to dig in, and I love food, if you haven't noticed, and so all of a sudden, I start cutting, and I'm like, this is going to be the best thing ever, and I dipped in put it in my mouth, and initially the first bite was like, ha <laughs> it's heaven, because it was like so greatly cooked, only to be like, mm, heaven is followed by not heaven, and I wasn't sure what was that secondary taste, but it was something that was not heavenly to me, and I found out later that it was like sort of like a liver spread that was like lined in, it was like stuffed, and in my family we didn't eat liver, not only liver, but just liver like pateed, and so I remember the face, and now everybody's looking at you, and you're like, what do I do with this? You can't spit it out. That's really disrespectful. And I'm like, go down, please swallow it. But something was not as it seemed. There was a mass. The liver was masked inside of this beautiful meat, which I love all kinds of meat. And in that situation, it wasn't as it seemed. And this morning, we're going to talk about that principle from a story in Scripture in Acts 28. And so if you want to get ready, you can actually turn to Acts 28. And we're going to read the first nine verses of it. But I believe not only that principle that we see happen in this story, but a principle that happens in our lives all the time. Because a lot of times in our lives, in our relationships, in our friendships, in our ups and downs of our journey, sometimes life gives us what we didn't expect. Sometimes we get hurt. Sometimes we bite into that and realize that wasn't it. Or in Paul's case, you gather sticks because on our lives we gather friendships, we gather relationships, we gather skills, we gather good things in our heart and in our mind. But along that journey, sometimes we bring in stuff that we didn't think was really there. And so we're going to talk about that mask and then how we can uncover it and get free from it and walk into a freedom for our lives. So we're okay to go there if you're okay. If you're online, hit like. If you're here, just give me a head nod or even a, just a gist, you know, something so I know that you're paying attention. But we're going to start from verse 1 of Acts 28. It said, once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. I, I actually messed up again this morning on this. We're going back. Give you a little precursor. Got to give the context. Paul was on a boat. He's on his journey in Acts 27. We see he's on his journey, and Luke is giving such a great definition and description of what's happening. They've been traveling. They even said where they're traveling, what kind of waves were, where they had stopped, where they ported, because it's a historical event. They wanted to show the accuracy of this. So Luke, who's on the journey, writes this, and it says that a northeastern or northeastern comes in and it starts to batter the whole boat apart. God speaks to Paul and says, don't freak out. Everybody's going to make it if they stay on the boat because you're not done your journey yet. You need to get to Rome and you will stand before Caesar, like I said. You will entertain there so that you can actually have your impact that you are supposed to. So they're full of prisoners. There's 276, I believe, prisoners on board. Now the boat has come ashore, everything has happened, and they float in. Some swim in, some float on things, and this is what happens. They end up in Malta in verse 2. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all before it was because it was raining and cold. When they see the islanders, in some translations it says barbarians, it wasn't meaning that they were there you know, with the spears ready to kill them. It just meant that they, didn't, they weren't of the Roman descent or of that background, so they were foreigners. They were people that didn't have that same background. So the islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, and as he put it on the fire, what happened? A viper, driven out by the heat, fastened himself on the hand. 
So I brought a prop. You can't see it from a distance. It's a snake. It's exactly. I saw some people when I lifted it up, even in here, they're like, Ugh. and that's exactly how I feel. You know, I'm not a big snake fan. I was talking this morning to someone in the, in the building asked who likes snakes online, you know, give a like or not like if you like snakes. I'm not a big snake fan. So I can just imagine what's going on. You gather all this brush. You think you were doing something good. He could have been all upset and said, my life has been terrible. Look at the raw deal I got. I'm shipwrecked. I'm on the shore. My life is wrecked. But he goes and he gathers wood. Now he gathers wood. And as he gets close to the fire while he's doing something good, the snake latches on to his hand. Latches on and it begins to inject, or as we would think, inject poison. That's what the islanders are thinking. So we're going to read a little bit further. And it says, It fastened onto his hand. When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, This man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, the goddess Justice has not allowed him to live. But Paul did what with the snake? He said he shook off the snake into the fire and suffered no ill effects. So think again. Now he's done something good. These people have been nice to him. He's doing these good things. A snake bites him, and everybody else says, no, you got what you deserved. You deserve to get hurt. You were a murderer. You're a prisoner. You're on the boat with all the prisoners. You got what you deserved. Justice is served. And then we see he didn't suffer any effects. Verse 6. The people expected him to swell up or to suddenly fall dead, but after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said, he was a god. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home and showed us generous hospitality for three days. His father was sick in bed, suffering, and Paul went in to see him and after prayer placed his hands on him and healed him. Verse 9, when this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. So we're getting the context before we jump into three points here. So you got the context, he gathers all this wood, he thinks he's getting wood, they figure it would have been late October, early November, or somewhere in that fall pattern, so at this time, it's cooler, the snakes are getting ready for their long sleep, so what happens if you've been around snakes or nature, they go dormant, they start to stiffen up, they're not as active, they're hiding, so they're underneath the brush. So he picks it up, he goes by the fire, it warms up, and when it warms up, it clamps down on him, he shakes it off, and everybody, think about this, how mad you would be, everybody around is like, wonder when he's going to fall over and die. It didn't say anybody tried to help him. It's just like they looked on to see if he would die. They expected him to fall dead right now. And so like, some of them are probably taking wagers. I got five minutes. I got 20. And so what happened was none of that occurs. And when they do, they say there's something different about that man, how he responded. So they take him and they give him hospitality in the home. He brings healing through the power of God, unmasks the power of God and the love of God to this official. Then the rest of the nation, the rest of the island, all come to the home and are healed because of how he responded when he was snake bitten. So this morning, we're going to talk about three truths because all of us will encounter snakes in our lives. All of us have some hidden things inside of our hearts and our lives that we have left unaddressed, that have been hiding in with the sticks. Then we need to realize how we are to deal with them, and that's the journey we're going to go on. So the first truth this morning is this. You need to check what you're collecting. When you start gathering things and when you're around people, when you've had the ups and downs, how many have had situations where you have lost? You know, you've, you've been through a situation and maybe it was a relationship and you were hurt in that relationship. In that relationship, there's a lot of good things, but out of it, sometimes there becomes little hurts or resentment or unmet expectations. Maybe your life hasn't played out the way you expect it, and you're living with offense, you're living with bitterness, you're living with fear, and maybe even hidden sins inside of your heart. These are all sort of snakes that we have gathered along the journey. We didn't start with them, but as we've been going through the ups and downs, things have attached onto our lives, and many times we don't even realize that they came in with us. Paul, the lesson that he learned, and like the title of our whole series, is he didn't recognize what laid beneath. And how many of us, and the question is asked, is along your journeys and your victories, what have you gathered? Has everything you've gathered along your life been sticks or been useful? Or somewhere you've gathered on hurt, maybe hurts of the past, resentment, bitterness, or sins of the past, lust, that we've hidden in our heart, and they've been like snakes inside And because they've been hiding there, we sit there and say, I don't see you, so you can't be harmful. Ever thought that and said, well, it's not harming anybody what I'm doing. It's not harming anybody of what I've watched or what I watched late at night when nobody's watching. It's not harming anybody. 
But just like in this snake, what's hidden in our heart, all of those things, eventually will be exposed. Eventually, it is going to wake up. Many of us in our area have wood stoves. I don't, but I have, we used to when we were in Echo Bay. And in this time of year, you start to gather your wood, and you don't want to do it when it's cold, and you're making your wood piles. And some people put their wood piles inside. And when you put your wood piles inside, what usually comes in with the wood? Sometimes there's bugs. Sometimes there's mice. You know, or other things. But every once in a while, you get a snake. And that snake, you don't realize. You gather it just like what was happening there. You pick it up. You bring it inside. And you're like, perfect. It's there. I didn't see anything. It didn't do anything. But what happens when things start to heat up? It starts to come alive. It starts to wake up. And as we're going to look in a second, that's just like our lives. Because the enemy of our soul, the devil, he wants nothing more for us not to address or check what we've gathered on our journey. On our journey, we've all picked these things up. If we're honest, we've all been in relationships. We've all had employees or employers that have hurt us. And from those moments, we don't want to get back to them because we've gathered them. It lays beneath, dormant, and we think it's not going to make an effect until it does. Because the key is, is the snake is there, and that hidden sin, it says throughout Scripture, that if we don't deal with the hidden sin, that's why before communion, we're going to have communion next week, so I encourage you, get your emblems ready, we'll have emblems here, all individually wrapped, but next week we're going to have communion, but at the beginning of communion, what do we always say? Prepare your heart. Check your heart to make sure that there is nothing that shouldn't be in your heart. This is what's happening. You need to check this morning, we need to check our hearts and gather, have we have snakes When we thought we were bringing sticks inside, have we let snakes get inside and have we knowingly left them there or are they hiding there and we don't even know what happened? Paul didn't know he had a snake there. All of us have unknowing sin or unknowing hurts that are there and the only time we see them exposed is the second point, is the fact that heat makes the masks come off. And when the masks come off, often we get snake bitten. So think, these We've been wearing them. This is how you get into stores. When it gets hot, do you like wearing them? I will be honest. No, not at all. I was joking this morning. I was joking with one of the other leaders here today. And we said, you know, wearing these has brought us back to almost to like being a 13 or 14 year old, you know, teenager. All of a sudden it's like the pimples are all coming out. And we're breaking out because you start to sweat and you're like, where did this come? I have to get like the little boxes of like oxy pads. You know, you used to have those and you put them on your face. We're aging ourselves if we knew what those were. But the fact is, is we used to use those to take care of it because when it gets hot the first thing we want to do is take off the mask we want to expose ourselves in the same way in life when pressure comes it exposes what's underneath it's really easy to keep that sin dormant it's really easy to keep the pain the resentment the offense dormant and you don't even recognize that it's there until it's not Until you get close to the fire and either God reveals it and he brings it to light, like it says in Ephesians 5.13, it says everything exposed by the light becomes visible. When you get close to the fire, when you get close to the heat, when the pressure starts to pack down, and this year, 2020, we have been living in a pressure cooker. Every day is pressure packed. Things are different. Things are different in the church, in your business, in your home. There are stressful times. Have you ever got mad at somebody? During this time, people you never would get mad at or things you would never say or do, they have happened. Think of this question. I want you to ask yourself this. Have you ever had something rear its ugly head in you or in others when the heat got turned up in your life? You're like, no, I don't have a problem with anger. And then it seems like just a few minutes later, somebody gets on your nerves and you're like, I can't believe you did that. Why'd you do that? And you're throwing your hockey stick and you're dropping the gloves. It's like, fight. And they're like, it's not even that hockey. We're just in Canadian Tire. You know, and then you realize that you've got these issues that are deep inside of you, but the pressure of our day, the pressure of our lives, the pressure of relationships, what do they do? They unmask and they expose what's really going on under the surface. Those snakes that we haven't dealt with or haven't checked or addressed, they will rise to the surface. They'll rise to the surface in your marriages. They'll rise to the surface in your families, in your workplaces, in your community, at Foodland, on social media. Check this. It will expose what's going on underneath, good or bad. It's not all bad. 
Because when it gets exposed, you can realize, I've got a lot of sticks, I'm building things, I'm moving forward. But sometimes it exposes the snakes. And it's not always a bad thing because many times God is actually exposing those snakes because he wants us to walk in the full purpose that we were called to do. Because the truth is, is when a snake gets exposed in the nature, in our house, what's its normal response? If it feels threatened that it's going to lose its home, it will bite. Even doing some studying on snakes, and you imagine how much I didn't like that. I had to look at all these pictures of snakes. I'm like, I can't sleep. No, just joking. But it was true. And when you're looking, when you're in there, you're not supposed to build your campsite near brush or you will encounter a snake. And then what happens is snakes don't like fire. They're not a big fan of fire because they like to be secretive and they don't like to be exposed because now they are in danger. But if you're walking along, if you just let it go and leave it to its own, usually it won't do anything until it wants to. But if you make it feel threatened like you're evicting it from its house, it will defend itself and begin to strike. How many of us have, when we realize that there's hidden sin, there's junk underneath the surface, and we recognize and start to address it, then we start to say, oh, I don't like this feeling. I don't want to give it up. I don't want to give up that sin. I like falling back into it. Sin is good for a season. It feels good for a season. And we don't want to let it go. Or in our lives, if you've been hurt or you've been bitten in a relationship, we respond two ways. We say, I'm keeping my distance. I'm going to run away. Or we bite back. What do we often do when pressure comes? Even in relationships. A husband goes, I can't believe he did that. We throw something that we never should throw back at our wives. And we say, I can't believe, remember when you were in the past, you used to do this. And then the response sometimes comes back from the other side of the spouse is, you always did this and this is why I do that. What that is exposing is snakes inside of our heart, inside of our mind, that there's some hurt still left there. And if we haven't addressed them, if we don't shake them off, as you're going to see in a second, we will bite back and bite back. And when we bite back, everybody gets hurt. And then we distance ourselves out of fear, and then we hide more snakes. And then our heart, or our woodpile, instead of being full of sticks, becomes full of dangerous snakes. And these snakes lie inside all of us. They're like landmines that the enemy has placed there, waiting that if we don't dress, when we step on them, they want to entangle you, steal your purpose, steal your focus, and steal your testimony. And the enemy wants nothing more than it to come out at the most inappropriate time that will steal you off of what you're supposed to do. The enemy wanted nothing more than to stop Paul on the journey. He just stopped the shipwreck. He saved all those prisoners' lives. They were going to die. It literally says in Acts 27 that the soldiers were freaking out and it says, we've got to kill them all because in those days if the soldiers, if they didn't, if they lost the prisoners, their life was on the line. So we need to kill them all. But Paul, because of his influence, because of how he responded under pressure, had favor with, with the centurion and the centurion convinced him all, says, don't do it, trust this guy. They get to the shore and then when they get to the shore, Paul had every reason to respond negatively when he was snake bitten, but he didn't. And when he chose to address the snakes earlier in his journey, and we see Paul along his journey, even in his, in his salvation journey, he had to address some of the hurts and some of the old beliefs of his ways. And when those changed, God changed him, and it made an impact that changed everybody else around him. It exposed who you are, because how you, have, how you respond during times where pressure is will expose who you are truly, and it will expose how you view God and who God is to everyone else around you. And I don't know about you, but that's kind of scary sometimes. How I respond in food land when the pressure's on reveals really the character of my heart, my true character, but it also, to people who don't know Jesus Christ, it paints a picture of who Jesus is. So when I carry around those snakes and let them spoil over of resentment, bitterness, offense, and I'm spreading stuff around people or saying, I can't believe that Sally did this or Bobby did this, what I'm doing is I'm saying to other people, that's the character of God. When pressure comes, how you respond, the snakes that you let out or don't address, show people who God is. And you unmask the wrong, you put a mask on God of who he is. So we need to make sure as we jump in and we get close there to break the cycle. Paul broke the cycle. Let's look really quickly of the positive responses and what happened before we go to our last point this morning. Paul, he gets shipwrecked. Okay, So he saves all of the soldiers. He gets them all there, but things still go crappy for him. Some might not like that word, I'm sorry, but it was pretty crappy. If you think about it, you're doing everything right, you're doing what God asked you to do, you're on a ship, you're on your way, you're still a prisoner, you get there, you get shipwrecked, and you land on the shore, and you're like, seriously? 
there's a lot of worse people here. You go and get the wood. That's what I probably would have been like. I'm tired. I've just been shipwrecked. I saved all your lives. You get the wood. You can at least do that for me. But what does Paul do? Paul's like, no, I still want to serve. I'm still going to gather. My job's not done. My purpose isn't done. He starts gathering the sticks. So he shows right away his character, his humility. I'm not above anybody else. So he gathers the sticks. Then when he gathers the sticks, the snake bites. Me? I'd be like, seriously? Are you kidding me, God? And he doesn't even worry about it. He just says he shook it off into the fire. He says, you don't like the fire? I'm going to throw you in there. He didn't even panic because he knew who he was and where he was going. Then when everybody else is chirping him, he's getting ridiculed. How many times in your life have you been ridiculed? Have you been bitten? Have things not worked out? Have you been wrecked? Those are all the characteristics of our lives. Many of us, 2020, we've been wrecked. Things have been turned upside down. We have been snake bitten in our relationships, in our friendships, in our lives, where it feels like everybody's turned on us and have bit down. We feel like we've been ridiculed and that we've been judged. How do you respond to those things? Church, here and online, how are you responding when you're wrecked, when you're snake bitten, and when you're ridiculed? Paul, he sat there and he says, shaking it off. I'm not going to let this win. I might be bitten, but I'm not defeated. Forget this. And he shook it off. He was like, you know, Taylor Swift. He was like, good old Tay-Tay, you know, shake it off. I didn't do a dance. You know, maybe you can at home, but I, you know, didn't pull out any dances for that. But the truth is, is if we want to get free and we want to walk into the freedom that God has for you, for your heart, for your home, for your families, and we want to learn how to deal with being snake bitten, you need to learn to shake it off. Because when you do, it will unmask the true you inside of you who God made you to be, but it will also unmask God's power and his love for everybody else around you. Because the world is watching. Church, online, when you're writing things and you're hating on the prime minister, guess what? I might not always agree with everything he does, but if we would spend more time praying than hating, it, how we respond will show the condition of what lies beneath our hearts. How we respond in their community will show the condition of our hearts. Are we a snake? Ooh. Are we a stick? How you respond will determine what's running your life. So how do we do it? The very first thing, how do we shake it off? How do we learn to do that? Using Paul's lesson in Jesus' life, even from this story, Paul. Number one, focus on the promise, not the bite. Focus on the promise, not the bite. It's really hard. When they bite you, like if a snake bit me, you would hear me screaming like a high pitch, like, ah! You know, it's there, and then I'd be throwing in using a shovel. I'm just being honest. Liam, he doesn't care. Liam, he goes around, he sees him on the road, he just, like, picks him up. I'm hopefully he's not listening right now, but if he chased me, I would be like sprinting down there like, you know, Donovan Bailey back in the day, you know, running, running down the road because I'm not a fan of snakes. But I need to focus on the promise or focus on the vision, not the bite. Because that's what Paul did. He got bit. Everybody else was focusing on the snake. But instead he sat there and says, I'm not going to die here. I'm not defeated. And how did he know that? The same way that he knew he wasn't going to die in the shipwreck because God told him. If you listen to what God has planned for your life, you realize that he has a future and a bright future for you. He has a plan for your life and it's a good plan. All the promise of God that you're the head, not the tail. All of those things that he's for you, not against you. If you hold to those things, you sit there and say, yes, I'm hurt today. Yes, that relationship left a hurt. Yes, I've got the sins of the past. Yes, I've got all these things. But God, I'm not looking at that. I'm looking at your promise that said, you are for me and you're going to get me through this. He knew he wasn't in Rome and he sat there and he said, the God who's getting me to Rome is bigger than the snake here and it's under his feet we have to remember right from the beginning the serpent is under the foot of God Jesus came to put his foot on the enemy trust that his foot is on the enemy over every sin and every hidden thing that's in your heart every snake he's stomping on it and trust that over the bite forget about the bite and the second thing you need to do is get close to the fire Ephesians 5, 8 through 14. I'm not going to read it all for you today. I read a little portion, but I encourage you this week, pull that up. Ephesians 5, 8 to 14. And it all talks about living in the light. That it will be exposed and what becomes visible in the light changes everything. And in Scripture, a lot of times we see fire can represent what? God or His presence. And so in this, we're going to take a little liberty and say, just like when you get close to the fire, snakes don't like it and want to get out of there. If we get close to Him, if we get close to God, He's going to bring clarity of vision. He's going to bring warmth and light that will reveal all the stuff that needs to come out. The warmth will actually make all of the junk 
rise to the surface, but if you're near the fire, you can actually get rid of the snakes. What is the role of the Holy Spirit beyond encourager, beyond empower? Some of that is He's the convictor. He convicts us of the things in our lives that should not be there. So when we get close to the fire, day of Pentecost was He was represented by Tongues of fire. And so when we get close to the fire, things that we can't see about ourselves or hurts that we see in other people, all of a sudden they rise to the surface and God begins clarity of vision. And then His refining fire cleans that up so that we can walk in the fullness and with the full purpose that He's called us to do. But you can't walk in that until you get close to the fire. And the greatest truth is He is also the protector. The fire protects us. So when we get close to Him, He protects our heart, protects those areas that when we let those go, sometimes when you forgive somebody and let go of those hurts, it's hard. You're scared you're going to get hurt again. But when you allow Him to be your protector, you begin to trust again. Joy starts to come back. Peace starts to come back. And that person who when they would walk by used to always get hurt, all of a sudden you realize like, oh, that didn't even affect me this time. They walk right by and you're like, Hi. And you start to realize that God has been doing what in your heart? He's been cleaning it up. He's been taking the snakes out. So we got to get close to the fire this morning. I'm going to ask you to begin to pray even where you're sitting right now because we get to our final two little thoughts. And ask him that. Say, God, while I'm sitting here today, Holy Spirit, begin to shine a light into my heart. Begin to turn the heat up in my life. Is there sins Or is there feelings of disappointment, resentment, bitterness, hurt, fear, things that I shouldn't be having in my life, are they there? And are you going to bring them to the surface for me? Because if we do, I believe if we get to the end, he'll remove them. He'll not only reveal them, but he'll take them out and he'll bring freedom to our lives. We get to the the third one. Don't bite back. Many times when we get hurt... We want to bite back. We want to get even. If you hurt me and you drop the gloves, I want to drop the gloves and hit back. We've got to choose to not bite back because if you bite back, just like when the snake did, if you choose like we do often in relationships, like we talked about, if you bite back, the DNA and the poison of the snake will now become in you. You will start to take on that character. Your hurts will compound and it'll actually be that you'll be walking in their fence. We saw that when we studied offense earlier last year, it becomes secondary offense and it's worse than the singular offense. Because now that hurt, which is never even yours, has been buried. You've gathered their snakes and said, here, why don't you hide with the sticks? Don't bite back. I said it this morning. I want you to grab it here. The whole journey that we are on is to act like Christ, not like a snake. So this morning, you've got to make the choice. Am I going to act like a snake or am I going to act like Christ? Most of us don't like to be around snakes. Don't bite back. When you're hurt, when it gets exposed, deal with it. Don't let it bite you or don't let it bite others. And if somebody else does it to you, why not just pray for them? Shake it off, get close to the fire, and say, I know my purpose. I'm praying for them because I want them to make to their purpose. Don't go hurt for hurt, then everybody gets hurt. Last but not least, we need to keep gathering and serving and loving. Paul was, Paul was hurt. People ridiculed. Like we said, he was wrecked, he was bitten, and he was ridiculed. And what did he keep doing? He kept serving. He kept gathering sticks. A pastor that I know that, that I went to one of his intensives, he made a comment when we were walking through some of these thoughts about leadership, and he used this, and I never understood it until I started to study, and he says, in your life, you've got to recognize that there's more sticks than there are snakes. Jesus recognized that there was a lot more sticks than there were snakes in our world, in our lives. What did he do with the disciples? He gathered sticks. He invested and he poured into people. Did he know that there was a snake in the bush? You bet. He knew Judas was going to bite him. But what did he do to the snake? Shook it off. Loved on him. Forgave him. Put some safeguards in. But cared for him. In our lives, we need to remember that just because we're hurt doesn't mean we have to stop loving, caring, and gathering. Many times, our natural response is, I don't want to do it anymore. Life hasn't gone the way I planned And so we say, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to get in relationships anymore. I'm going to distance myself from my family. I'm going to do all these things. That's not the answer. Most of the times when we're the most discouraged, the best response is to actually love and serve. When we do that, we come awake, we come alive. So it leaves us this morning with this. And we see what happens when that happens. 
if you begin to apply these truths, I believe we'll start to look like what happened with Paul. When Paul displayed these things, what happened to, the, what happened to that small island or that portion of the island in Malta? It was turned upside down. Because when we respond positively and shake off the snake bites, we amass the love and the amazing love and power of our God. They didn't know God, but they met him. And the picture that they saw of a Christian and of a Christ follower and of a God was not one that was biting everybody, but instead was one who was bringing life, was bringing healing, was bringing joy. This morning, can that be said of you? Can that be said of you? That even when somebody bites you, do you bring freedom, peace, and love? Or do they say, you don't want to bite them because they're going to bite back? When the heat gets turned up, how do you respond? This morning as we get ready to pray, I'm going to challenge you wherever you are, whether you're here or whether you're online, maybe as we ask you to pray about and let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart and say, is he working on something? I believe today that God, we're getting close to the fire. We're drawing into the fire, and he wants to remove those things. He wants to reveal the snakes, but he wants us to address it and to remove them. And I believe when we get ready to pray, he's going to remove things like hurt, offense, bitterness, disappointment, unmet expectations, sin that you've been holding on to for years, hurts of the past. And this morning, what I'm going to challenge you to do is wherever you're at, I'm going to challenge you to slide up your hand if you have a snake that you need to be dealt with. And this morning, I'm joining with you. There are snakes in my journey. I'm not like Christ yet. I want to be, and I'm journeying to be like Ephesians 5 once, says, be an imitator of Christ, but I'm not there. Sometimes when people bite me, I want to bite back, and it reveals to me I still have work to go. So this morning, I have some things I need God to address in my life. I've got to check what I've gathered. This morning, what do you need to be checked to be gathered? Whatever it is, I encourage you, lift up your hand and we're going to pray because I believe God is going to set you free and break those things off because that's who he is. He loves to bring healing. He loves to bring wholeness. So let's do that. Let's pray. Dear God, you see those hands wherever they're watching, whether it's here, whether it's on the beach or whether it's in their home, Lord, and you know what those represent. Because like we said last week, you know our heart. You know everything about us. You already know the snakes that we have gathered along the journey. And God, right now I ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would reveal them and then you would remove them. And that just like Paul did, we would shake them off and we would let them fall into your holy refining fire that we would be changed anew, that our lives would be so different and set apart that everywhere we would go today or we would go this week, people would see what's really beneath the surface. They wouldn't see the hurt. They wouldn't see the pain but instead they would see your love, your power unmasked in us. That where we would go, we would display the character of you, Jesus. That we would bring healing, that we would bring freedom, and we would bring health wherever we go. We wouldn't bring more snake bites. So ask, we ask this in your holy name. God, we give you our week, we give you our lives, and continue to reveal in us what needs to be revealed and continue to take what needs to be taken. We ask all of these things in your holy name we pray. Amen and amen. Church, whether here or online, be blessed and continue. Remember to keep gathering and remember there's more sticks than there are snakes. So be blessed this week and we'll see you next week.